You know, 2020 was one of the most difficult years of our life. And I'm looking at 2021 as one of the most greatest years of my life. And it's a year of possibility. And it means letting go of the stuff that's in the way. And so I am covering some things in this series of things that I feel are in the way for us, things that have been in the way for me, and how we can let go of them so that we can know Jesus on a more intimate, personal level, and we can also help to make Him known to others who are trying to find Him. So let's get ready for Let Go, and let's discover all that God has for us and helping others to find it as well. Y'all ready to fasten your seatbelts? Okay, we're talking today about letting go of social media. And here's what I mean by that, letting go of our device. Everybody got your phone? Can you pull your phone out and hold it in your hand? Now, I know that some of you read the Bible on your phone, and that's okay as long as you do it in airplane mode. The problem with reading your Bible on your phone, if you don't put it in airplane mode, is that you then have text messages that come through. And they come through at just the inopportune time. Is that correct? or emails or stuff like that. Today we want to talk about setting aside our device. So let's just take our phones and put it back up, okay? You can put it back up where you had it. Setting aside our device for God's advice. Does that make sense? And picking up the word because his advice is right here in his word. The Bible is the best-selling book of all times. You know that? For a reason. So it's putting aside our device, our phones, our tablets, our computers, our television, so forth, so that we can pick up the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 12 addresses that. If you want to, um, it'll be up on the screen. Again, I think it's fine to read the Bible from your phone. A lot of times, um, I mean, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I like to have this, right? But I do sometimes read the Bible on my phone. Um, And sometimes I listen to worship music on my phone. And uh, again, the problem is you got to put in airplane mode or else you get messages coming through. So we just want to have, we want God, we want, God wants to have our undivided attention. And that's what we want to focus on. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 through 12. So it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These words or these commandments that I give you today are to be on, to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down and when you get up. That just about covers it all, doesn't it? Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I I love this. Listen, this this is again the illustration of the generosity of God. Um, He brings you to the land to give you a, a a, a land with a large flourishing cities that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things that you, that you did not provide. Wells that you did not dig and vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And then when you eat and are satisfied, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Let's pray. Lord, we um, want to focus on your word today because we know that in your word there is life. We know that in your word there is satisfaction. As a line from Mick Jagger years ago, I can't get no satisfaction. Can I get an amen? Um, you know, and we're searching for that. I mean, but you, you just say here in your word, satisfied. And then, Lord, I'm reminded how you said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied. So Lord, would you satisfy us today with your word? Would you just speak through me your words to the people here that you love? We thank you for the way you're moving in our hearts. 
And we just, want, we just want more, Lord. We want more of you because we believe that you're the answer to the world's problems. We believe that you're the light of the world. We believe that you're, you're the city that's set on a hill high above everything else. And, and in that place, there's refuge. In that place, there's security. And there's, there's what we're looking for. So, Lord, we know that we're to live in this world, but we're not to be of it. And so just uh, help us to to know how we can overcome through the word. And we just pray uh, now that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Last Monday, I went to the hospital in uh, Lexington to see my eye doctor. Uh, by the way, my eye I had eye surgery, for those of you that don't know, corneal cell replacement. I had to have a second surgery because the first one didn't take. And uh, it's progressing well. Uh, I moved from uh, having 2200 vision, which is not very good, uh, a month ago to last Monday having 2040 vision out of this eye and 2020 vision with my glasses on. Can I get an amen? So, and I still have my, I still have the stitches in my eye because he said, you know, if, when the stitches come out, your eye, the stitches cause the eye to be blurry. And here's what's funny. If he had told me that at the very beginning, I wouldn't have had any faith. I was like, oh, it's just the stitches. I mean, it's, it's going to be fine. You know, when the stitches come out, I'm going to be all good. I wasn't even worried. I wouldn't have been anxious. I wouldn't have gone on this journey to believe that God's going to restore my sight. So he does things to challenge us. He do, does things to test our faith. Anyway, so I'm, in the, I'm at the hospital, and I'm going to meet Joseph, Nicola, Nicola who uh, plays keys. Um, they just got married, and he's in the College of Nursing. So... Um, he said, hey, why don't we meet at 12 and we'll grab a coffee together. So, so I'm down at UK Hospital, parking the parking garage, and um, I'm trying to find him in the College of Nursing. So anyway, we, we connect, we go to Starbucks, and there's uh, quite a long line. Um, I'm going to say long, I mean like seven or eight people. And uh, we get to the counter, and Joe treats me. He's got a Starbucks card, and, um, and I felt the Lord say, well, you treat the person behind you. And I mean, normally I do that kind of stuff, you know, but I don't, it's kind of like, Lord, can I just have a day off? You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and then I said to myself, okay, if I have an outreach card, if I have one of our business cards, you know, that says you matter, and on the back it says nothing is stronger than love, okay, I'll do it. So I reach in my pocket, and there's one, I got one card. And there's this young guy that's in line behind me in his early 20s, and I hand him the card, and I say, hey, I want to just buy your coffee for you today. This is just to show you God's love for free. And uh, he didn't know, he was just like, he didn't know what to say. He didn't say a word. He was really, really quiet. And then I think he thought it was a credit card because he tried to give it to the guy to pay for his coffee. And I said, no, no, no. I've, I said, I've got it. Uh, we get to the end of the counter, and, um, and, and, and we're waiting on our coffee, and I just kind of asked him, I said, hey, are you a student here? And he said, no, I'm here to have surgery. And I could tell it was something pretty serious. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I should pry, so I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. Um, I said, do you mind if I just pray for you? I mean, it's kind of like you feel, sometimes you feel like God is telling you to push the envelope a little bit because somebody's going to be receptive. As soon as I said that, he said, I would love that. And so right there at the end of the counter at Starbucks, I, I put my hand on his shoulder, and I prayed for this guy. I mean, I didn't pray some long-winded prayer, you know, I just, but I prayed for him. When I got done, he had tears in his eyes, and he said, thank you, sir. And Joe and I got our coffee, and we went to sit down, and he, and he goes, man, that was amazing. And, and he goes, he's back there talking to his parents about what just happened. And then I left that, and I went to find the, went, you know, go to find the doctor I was seeing down there because I was going to see his associate because my doctor who did the surgery is out of town, so I'm seeing his associate down there at UK Med Center. I'm not sure, quite sure where to go, and I asked somebody, "Can you help me find Dr. Cat's office?" And she said, "Sure, I can, yeah, I can take you right there, you know." So it's about it's about a ten minute walk. I mean, you know how big hospitals are, so it's way over here. She said, but she said, "I'll take you." I said, well, man, that's amazing. We're walking along, and I felt the Lord say to me, this is a person of peace. You know, Jesus said in Luke 10 that we're to reach out to people who are people of peace. And they're people who, like, they're open, and they seem to like you, and they seem to, 
Like they said, you, you think they may be interested, right, to know more. And so I just said, hey, I'm uh, down here from Louisville, and I'm a pastor, and, uh, and I just felt like I should ask you if you need prayer for anything. She said, you know what, I really do need prayer. I feel like I'm under a spiritual attack. And so as we're walking through the hospital, uh, we're in one of these big, uh, you know, headways going, going across the, the road, and, and uh, there's not a ton of people, but I just put my hand on her shoulder, and we just kept walking, and I started praying for her. When I got done, we keep walking, then she goes, well, can I pray for you? Is there anything you need prayer for? And so, I mean, I told her, you know, a few things about what, what's on my mind about our, our church, and then also about my eye, and uh, she prayed the most amazing prayer for me. So we just, we just stood over to the side, and she got done. She said, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it was, a, it was amazing. Let me tell you the point. The point is that you and I may be the only Bible that people ever read. We are the Word made flesh. It says in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says that, that um, about Jesus, it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. I, I love the, the message translation to the paraphrase. It says this, that the Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We're, we may be the only Bible, we may be the only word that people ever, ever read, and we are the word made flesh every single day. And uh, as we speak, and as we act, uh, you see, this, this, the, the Bible says, that is from the words of Jesus himself, he says, it's out of the heart the mouth speaks. I mean, if you want to listen to what's, what's in someone's heart, you just hang around long enough to hear them speak. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Uh, King David wrote in Psalm 119, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to God's word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against thee. I mean, if you want to be a, a better follower of Jesus, are you out of love, not out of religious duty? Remember, it's out of beauty, not duty. Um, you, you're going you're gonna to find the ability to do that by getting the Word into your life. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, how you can get the Word into your life more. So as you're like, okay, you're going to pray more. You're going to maybe fast. So what else do you do? You grab the Word, and you begin to read it, and you begin to get it into your heart and into your life. You know, um, Monday, I, don't, I know that you're not, uh, Jesus said don't draw a bunch of attention to when you fast. But I, I'm just, I do feel like I need to give an illustration that I'm taking Mondays as a day just to fast. And I will tell you the hardest time to get through it is then is like the evening when dinner comes. Because I don't know about you, but I love to eat. And I mean, I, lo I love to eat dinner, you know. I love, a, a lot of times my days are long and, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then on Monday, I usually stay home and, and just work on the sermon like the, most of the day and get, and get it done. Um, and sometimes I'm working up until the evening, till 8 o'clock, and then usually eating dinner. So anyway, long story short, last Monday, since I was in town to see, down, to see my doctor, I went, I went to see my parents, and I knew that wasn't going to be a good day to fast because they wanted me to have dinner with them. So I took Tuesday. Tuesday was my day to fast. And I will tell you that, I, you know, like through the day, I was fine. I mean, I was a little hungry, but I kept also saying, Lord, I just want to have a deeper hunger for you. That's the main thing I'm praying for, by the way, is I would have a deeper hunger for the Lord, and I would have a deeper experience of his presence in my life. So that night, I, I got home, and, uh, and then I'm starting to get hungry. You know what I mean? I mean, and it's that kind of thing where you're thinking about it. It's kind of like you're, you're that you know, like you're trying not to think about something, and then all you can do is think about it. All I could do is think about, you know, oh man, it'd be so good to eat Juicy's barbecue or, or chicken or whatever it might be. Um, so I decided because it was kind of cold to build a fire. But I love to build a fire, and I build a fire. And I just sat down because, you, see, what you do, you want to substitute the time you would normally spend fixing food or the time to eat the food even 
you would you spend that time in prayer and being with the Lord. So I sat down in front of the fire, and I felt God lay it on my. I felt God reminded me. I wouldn't say that He spoke to me directly. It, that didn't come until after, but He reminded me about Psalm 42. So I just I opened up Psalm 42 and I read it. And here's what I read: As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for You, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? And then notice what he says, the next line. He says, my tears have been my food. So obviously, as I read that, I was obviously David, who wrote this psalm, is fasting. Because his tears are his food. And why do we fast? We fast in order to have a deeper breakthrough of the presence of God in our life. We also fast because we're trying to make a major decision. We also fast and pray because we're trying to break an addiction in our life. Or we also pray and fast on behalf of somebody else that we really have a concern for. And and it's true, you may not do it, but once a year. I mean, fasting is one of those things, you know, like you may pray every day, but it's not necessarily you're supposed to fast every day. You may give weekly or bi-weekly every time you get a paycheck. But it doesn't mean that you necessarily do, you pray and fast like that. I mean, I heard one pastor of a church who was talking about prayer and fasting. It's a, it's a lot bigger church than what we are. But I thought it was an interesting point. They were in also a 21 days of prayer and fasting. And it's going to end with a, a night of just prayer together. He said, I, he said he's absolutely convinced that the time that they spent devoted last year to prayer and fasting was a huge reason why 1,500 people got baptized that, that year. So here's what God's laying on my heart. God's laying on my heart as we enter into this. It's sort of like set, it, it can set you up for the rest of the year. And it may be God leads you to revisit it. You know, so, so I'm sitting there and I'm reading that and I'm just continuing to focus. I want to focus on turning my physical desire for food my body is, is, is needing into a spiritual hunger that my soul is craving. When I got done reading Psalm 42, I felt, uh, this is when I felt a direct word from the Lord. See, I believe too as we pray and fast, we learn to hear the voice of God more, with more clarity. And it wasn't audible. It was intuitive. So I felt the Lord say to me, read Isaiah out of the same chapter as what you just read in Psalm 42. So he, so he said, read Isaiah 42. I read Isaiah 42, and here's what it says. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on you. As soon as I read that, I felt the Lord say to me, he goes, that's you. And that's how I look at you. Because, you know, I've had a growing journey of of trying to get more secure that God does see me that way. I've had a growing journey of feeling like, you know, that my past does not disqualify me. I've had a growing journey of just becoming more secure in God's love for me, that it's not based on performance equals acceptance. It's the it's, it's, it's the fact that he he, I, he loves me. I, I don't like do something to get love. I do something because I have love, and it just really touched me. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I have placed my spirit on you. I felt like that was a direct word from God, and it just really gave me a deeper confidence that that's exactly what he's done. And the truth is, he wants to do that for every one of us. If I had not taken that night, if I had just given in to my appetite and gone ahead and just, well, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and eat and just you know, go focus on that and turn the TV on and catch an NBA game or whatever. And I'm not saying there's something wrong with that. But if I, if I had just like lost my focus and instead of... And, and, that I never would have had that experience of that verse, which was a breakthrough of identity, of deeper identity for me. 
See, Jesus said, when you fast, not if you fast. He said, when you fast, the God who sees in secret will reward you. So there is reward for seeking God. I want to give you now an acronym for reading God's Word. Y'all ready? An acronym called MAPS, a guide to a deeper intimacy with God, okay? So MAPS, last week we talked about prayer. Y'all remember what the P stood for? We start with what? That's right, we start with praising. We start with praising, and then the R stands for repenting, and then, like, we need to change our attitude about something. And then the A is asking. We start to ask God for that. And then the Y is yield. We surrender. Go back and catch it online if you didn't get to listen to it all. A, ma- a maps, an, a guide to a deeper in- intimacy with God. The M stands for meditation. Meditation. So when you read the Bible, you want to read it slowly. You don't want to, like, rush. You, don't, you, want, to, you want to read it different than any other book in your life. You don't read it like a newspaper. You read it meditatively. God is trying to capture our attention. There's a line in Exodus about Moses. He's up on the mountain. And he notices notices this bush that's burning. And uh, he's in the desert area. And it wouldn't be unusual in the desert for like a bush to maybe catch on fire, but it would burn out. And he noticed this bush that was burning, and it wouldn't burn out. And it says this, so he went closer to get a closer look. And the, and the, and the, the Bible says this, that when God saw that he had Moses' attention, he spoke. See, God is looking for people who have a longer attention span. He's looking for people who aren't just trying to get something off their list. He's looking for people who will meditate on the Word. So what you want to do is you want to read the Bible more slowly, and here's what you're doing. You're looking for something. It's called called Lectio Divina, the divine reading. And it's basically where you read until something captures your attention. It might be a word or a phrase, and you pause and you think about that, and you meditate upon that. Okay, so here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will place my spirit upon him. So um, now as you meditate on on the word, you begin just to think about how is it speaking to me, okay? And um, what does this mean? And it may soften your heart in some way, and then you, or it may be, it may cause you to realize you don't have that in your life. Maybe it has to. Do, maybe you just read, "God's not giving you a spirit of fear, but love, power, and a sound mind," and you begin to realize you live a very, you live with a lot of fear, and so that captures your attention because you have a deficit. But you begin to talk because you've meditated. You begin to talk to the Lord, so you combine meditation with with talking to the Lord is what you, in terms of what you're reading. And then I want to tell you this, that the M stands for memorize. Let me, get, let, me, let me tell you something. This week I memorized that verse. And it even means more to me. Isaiah 42, verse 1. Here is my servant. And I memorized it the same way I meditate, slowly. That's how you memorize a verse. You memorize it by doing it slowly, and you see it in your mind's eye. You might not get it perfect. You go back and read it again. You do that a couple of times, and then you say it three or four times, and guess what will happen? You'll have it memorized. And it will become arsenal in your spiritual tool belt. When you need it, you can recall it, right? Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I have put my spirit upon you. See, every time that I start doubting, or every time I start getting insecure, or every time I start thinking, well, I don't have what it takes, or every time I start thinking, well, it's because of my past, I wasn't perfect, and I blew it here, and I did that, you know, God's not going to use me. No, I just pull out this verse, just like Jesus did. Hey, 
Jesus, look at those stones. Don't they look good for bread? Yes, but the Bible says, the Word of God says that man will not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Did you know that, that Jesus was tempted by the devil three times in the desert, and every time he quoted the, a, a Bible verse? Now, let me give you an amazing challenge. Y'all ready for this? Do you think that you can memorize one verse a month? How many of you think you could do one verse a month? Raise your hand. I mean, do you think that's doable? Think about that. One verse a month, that's 52 verses a year. 52, 50 times 50 years is 2,500 verses, if my, if my math is correct. Is that right? One, one verse a month. Oh, that'd be 12, wouldn't it? I was thinking like one week. Man, I'm trying to make it harder on you. How many of you think you can memorize one verse a week? Yeah, see, actually, I started off thinking about that, and the mar my wife goes, you know what, that might be a little too challenging for people. I want to suggest 12 verses a year. And that you put that on a calendar for January. Like, what will be your verse for January? And what will be your verse for February? And what will be your verse for March? And what about if you put, my, my put that on a wall? You remember those old calendars how you'd put, you know, January and you'd go to the next one, you know? What if you could create some visual and you have 12 key verses? Like for me, for January, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one who am I, who am I delight. I've placed my spirit on you. Man, I love that verse. It really spoke to me. Because I'm in a place in my life, I know I can't be effective in my own flesh, and my own talent, but I know that God can help me to be effective in his ability. So that's why I love that verse. So, memorize. And again, the way I did it myself is I just kind of got in a space where I wasn't trying to be in a hurry. And, um, and I just kind of thought about that verse, and I kind of saw it in my mind's eye, and then I would say it. Um, write it on a note card. And, um, and, and read it and then try to put the note card away and try to say it. A lot of times what I do is close my eyes and I, and I see it visually and then I try to say it slowly. And then if I get it wrong, I'll go back from the very beginning and start over. So meditate and memorize. And then the A stands for apply. How does, God's, uh, how does what you read apply to your life? And you want to ask certain questions such as, how does it change the way I see God? That's really, to me, that's kind of the first thing you want to think about. How does this change what I just read? The way, how does it change the way I see God? See, Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. So many of us have dysfunctional spirituality because we have a dysfunctional view of God. Some of, so many of us continue to have failure spiritually, and it's because we have the wrong view of God. If we get the right view of God through Jesus, the lens of Jesus, I'm telling you, it'll help change your failure rate. It'll increase your success rate. Because I think the reason we respond in failure a lot of times is because we have the wrong view of who God is. And uh, it's, not, it's, it's not encouraging us. And it's not lifting us up. Here's my servant whom I uphold. So how does it change the way I see God? And then, how, how does it change the way God sees me? So as I, as I focus on how it, changed, how it changes the way I see God, then I think about, well, how does that change? Since he's that, since God is this, how does it change the way he sees Robert? And then, how does it change the way I see myself? Uh, how does it change the way I see other people? Which can lead to praying for that person. And then, what is something God's leading you to act on? See, it's great for you to have a thinking change, but we also want to have an acting change. And James, it says, if you just hear the word, but you don't act on it, what good is that, right? So you want to think this. Everybody say head, heart, hands. Let's say it again. Head, heart, hands. Can we do the, you want to do the motions? Head, heart, hands. What is that? And the head is... God is trying to change the way we're thinking about something. That's the head. Heart, he's trying to change we, how we feel about something. And then 
hands, he's trying to change the way we act on something. So we want, when you read the word and meditate on it and memorize it, God's trying to give you a, heart, a head change, a heart change, and an act change. Because sometimes we get the word intellectually, and, the, and let me tell you something, the Bible says in James that the demons believe and they tremble. You also need to change the way you feel about something. And this is where we need to get more real with God about what's going on and how we feel. Because as God can heal what we can feel. And we, we, a lot of us are, you know, we're so good even talking with other Christians about sharing from our head. But we're not very good at sharing from our heart. Like getting more vulnerable and getting more transparent, right? So we want to go from head to heart, and then that helps lead to action. God, how you wanted me to act on this. And then, the th- and then thirdly, so, so first of all, M is, is, is meditate and also memorize. And then A is apply. And then the, the, the P stands for pray. We pray the word that God just spoke to us. This is where it gets kind of exciting. Because if you're reading, if you stumble across a verse that God's trying to grab your attention about and speak to you, and then you begin to think about how it applies to your life, God wants to answer that word in your life, or else it wouldn't even been in the Bible. In fact, Jesus said this. He said, if you, I think it's up on the screen, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. If if my word if if you if my if you remain in me and my words remain in you you can ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. And, and and there's another verse in 1 John chapter 5 it's around verse 14 if you want to jot it down. It says this if we ask anything according to God's will he hears us. And if we know he hears us we know that we have the petition that we've asked of him. So I believe as we're reading the word and and it speaks to us in some revelatory way it's something that God already wants to do. It doesn't mean that it's going to happen immediately, but we should hold on to the faith that it's coming and it's going to happen. And then the S stands for we share the word that God has spoken to us about with somebody else. We share, we write down in a specific way that God spoke to us, like some, some verse, and then we share that word with one other person. God's word speaks to our worries. God's word, I just, I want, I'm going to say these things, and let me tell you if you think there's a world of people who experience some of these things. God's word speaks to our worries, our anxieties, our stress, our money, or lack thereof, our conflicts that we may have in relationships, how to have better relationships, our fears, our future, our purpose, and our identity. So as you're meditating on the Word, as you're memorizing the Word, as you're praying the Word, God's going to give you some specific Word that you could share with one other person. So you look for someone who seems open. You you look for who are the people. I said this before. If God has put people close to you physically, it's probably because he wants to use you spiritually. So you look for the people who are close to you, starting with those in your home, starting with people that you work with, starting with friends that you have. And you pray about how to share that one word. You know, I mean, be more bold, right? Again, you're looking for people who are open and who seem to want to know more. So share a specific way God spoke to you from his word with one other person person. This week, I want to give you a passage that I would like to to ask you to focus on in terms of reading the Word. Now, you may already be have a reading plan that you're following, but I would like to suggest that you read John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, every single day for seven days. And then next week, I'm going to share part two about letting go of social media so we can grab the Word. And we're going to look at Psalm chapter 1, And I'm going to kind of break it down for you in terms of some of the ways that God has spoken to me about it. 
And, um, and then we're gonna, I'm going to suggest that you read like a psalm a day. John chapter 15, I want to just read it to you and then bring a few closing uh, comments from the verse. John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. Now, I'm reading a little faster than I might normally do if I were reading it more meditatively, by the way. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown away and withers, and such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy will be in you and that your joy will be complete. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but I would suggest going on through verse 17. And each day, ask God as you get ready to read the word, say, Lord, would you show me something I didn't see before? So John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17, every day this week. Let me bring a couple of highlights to you that that spoke to me. Verse 3, Jesus said this, you're already clean because of the word that I've spoke spoke to you. So God's word cleanses me. It cleanses me from all my sin. I don't have to pay for what I did. Jesus Christ has already paid for it. And his word cleans me, and it cleanses me. And then he said, If you remain in me, in my word, verse 7, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. God's word gives me confidence in praying. And God wants to give you a confidence as you pray. And then verse 9 says, as the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Jesus loves me the same way the Father loved him. Think about how powerful that is. Jesus Christ loves each of you the same way his father loved him. How powerful is that? And so, um, I'm clean because of God's word. I'm confident because of God's word. I'm close because of God's love. And what does that do for me? It gives me joy. Verse 11, Jesus said, I've told you these things so that my joy will be in you and, and your joy will be full or complete. So there's so much to discover in this book. It's the best-selling book of all time for a reason. We're to read it differently than any other book in our life. It's the treasure that's hidden out in the field. It's the pearl of great price. In it, David wrote, His serv- your, your servant is warned. And by keeping these words, there's great reward. So I pray as you continue your praying and your fasting, again, I know it's not easy. You know, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that I love fasting. But I, made, I, but I will tell you, I've done, I've done different fasts throughout my life, like once a year, and sometimes I've done it a little more often. There was a, one, a period when Marcia and I were trying to, you know, it took four and a half years for her to get pregnant with hope. So for a whole year, we actually like, I think we fasted like one, once a week because we were praying for a breakthrough. And she, of course, did get pregnant. But um, I'm not going to stand up here and tell you that, I, that it's easy. But I will stand up here and tell you that it's worth it. And it's, it's far more worth the moment you're going through because there's something on the other side of it. So I want to encourage you to pray about fasting and spending that time praying, seeking the Lord, reading his word, praying that you will be closer to him, praying for some other breakthrough that you're trying to get into your life. 
Because Jesus said, when you fast, your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So let's just pray right now. As we just have our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I'm not going to ask you if you did last week. But as we continue on this journey over, or through the rest of this month, just to seek the Lord a little bit more in praying and fasting. And I mean, if for some reason you cannot absolutely fast food for some medical reason, then you fast the next equivalent of something that's, you know, you desire. You just give that up. But you're not telling me, you're telling the Lord. If you're, and, and let me tell you something, and don't set, don't set something so high that you're not going to be able to reach it. I mean, it's, be, it's better to start with something like small, a small goal, and then maybe move to something more. This week, if you're willing to not only pray, but also spend some time like fasting. Maybe you're still not sure when or what, but you're going to figure it out. And let me tell you, you've got to have a plan. You can't just go into this, well, you know, would you just raise your hand and, as a way of telling the Lord that I'm going to do this, that I'm going to enter into this? And then if you're, if you're willing to spend a little extra, maybe you don't feel led to fast, and that's fine. But you're willing to spend some extra time praying, more than you might normally do. Would you just raise your hand and tell the Lord that? Say, Lord, I'm willing, I want to spend some extra time praying than what I might normally do. Because the answer to our country's woes are found if his people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray. And seek his face. And turn from their wicked ways. And then God says, I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal the land. And the healing starts with us. So Lord, I just pray that, uh, that we will see you calling us to spend that time with you. We will see you calling us to fast something. To meditate on your, to read the word, and not just read it, but to meditate on it, and maybe even to memorize the word. I pray that you would open up the word to us this week in a way that we've never experienced before. That we will see things in your word, we will experience things with you that we've never experienced before. Lord, you are the answer that we need. We don't need it. You know, we may need something else that you want to give us in our life, but right now you're the main answer. You're the foundation. You may build a, a room on our house that represents a relationship. You may build a room on our house that represents our job. You may build a room on our house that represents retirement. You may build a room on our house that represents our physical health or, or, or some relational health. You may build a room on our house that represents recreation. You may build a room on our house that represents fun. But we will never get to any of those things if we don't make you the foundation. So, Lord, may, as, as we continue to seek you, we're saying we want you to be our foundation, Lord. We want you to be the rock that we build our house upon so when the rains come and the floods come, that house is going to stand because it was built upon a rock. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.